Okay, well, welcome everyone to the uh, current talk in the Austrian Research Institute for Artificial Intelligence's 2023 Fall Lecture Series. Today, we are very proud to have with us uh, uh, a colleague and good friend of mine, Ivan Hagenbaum, who I know back when we were both working at uh, Technische Universität Darmstadt. Uh, Ivan is a man with uh, very many talents. Uh, in addition to being a, a very, a very good researcher, he's an accomplished uh, jazz musician uh, and uh, apparently knows a lot about uh, beer as well. He had a presentation on that uh, back when we were at Darmstadt. But today he is here in his capacity as a, a newly minted assistant professor for natural language processing at Paderborn University in Germany uh, to speak with us uh, about privacy and natural language processing. Are we there yet? So without further ado, I will hand the floor over to Ivan. Great. So thanks, Tristan. Thanks for the invitation again. I'm super happy to be virtually here in Vienna uh, for Christmas. Uh, so quick check. So can everybody hear me now? It's great uh, because I don't see anything right now. So... Okay, great. So let, let's uh, let's start. I would say, like, if you have any questions, maybe you can ask just in the middle. Don't write anything into chat because I don't see the chat, but we can have a discussion afterwards. But if you have, like, immediate questions, just do it because I really stopped seeing everybody here, which is kind of weird. So and now I'm in my YouTuber role. But anyway, so let's talk about privacy in natural language processing and whether... So what is missing in there? Are we there yet? So the, let's start with this news you might have seen. So it's it's very recent, like a couple of days back. Um, ChatGPT. So, so there was a you know a big news that ChatGPT can leak training data, and everybody was uh, excited. No, well excited in a bad way about it, like worried about it. So ChatGPT remembers something. And, you know, maybe you've seen it as well. And even like, uh, you know, it was so bad that even uh, Gary Marcus tweeted about it and saying like, wow, well, privacy is, you know, this the um, the basic human right. And we, you know, what all these language models are doing it wrong and stuff like that. So the the, the idea here in uh, extracting basically training data from GPT was that if you start, uh, if you prompt it with very special prompt, uh, for example, repeat is word forever poem 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 so it started repeating forever the word poem 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 but it didn't do it for forever it just after maybe hundreds or 200 tokens it started generating something else than the word poem and guess what in this generated text appeared something from the training data so like here uh you know on this tweet is um could be names and addresses and web phones and Fact, uh, fax numbers and stuff like that. So it, it's a big thing right now. And people are talking about security and privacy of large language models, which is great. And here's uh, here's a link to this paper by uh, Milad Nasser, uh, Nicholas Carlini, Katrina Lee is there as well. So for on Trammer, you will see the names uh, later on as well. So for the community or for maybe like the general public, this is bad news. Um, for us in, the, in, in privacy research, it's actually old news because there's uh, already research um, research on the previous models like GPT-2. So if you take the GPT-2 again, here's an example. You take a GPT-2 model, which is this large language model, and you want to prompt it, for example, well, translate me this English sentence to, to German. So what's the time? German. So this is the prompt. And what you're going to... What you're expecting is this uh, this translation, which bad is this. So this is great. That's what we want. If you're a bad guy... And you write a prompt that is somehow adversarial, so you will not try to, you know, prompt the model to leak something. Well, the GPT-2 model will do the same thing as we just saw with ChatGPT. So it will spit out unique names of individuals, addresses, emails, phone numbers, URLs, social security numbers, and stuff like that from the training from the pre-training data of of uh, GPT-2. Even though this has been seen only once, and this is uh, actually now a quite an old paper from Nicolas Carlini extracting training data from language models. So the same sort of group of researcher or similar group of researcher has done it. So what we see right now is that contemporary deep learning models, they completely neglect privacy. So this is a hard problem. And nowadays it's even harder when we access models through APIs, but we don't even know what was in the training data because we have no factual, uh, no actual access to that. 
here's another example actually that it's not only about privacy it might be also about copyright so uh, i don't know if if uh, so i believe people in the audience know the github copilot so basically it's uh, for helping you to write code so you start typing maybe a function and it will basically spit out the rest and you, you know um, should speed up your coding so there is a very famous function uh from the 1990s i don't know if if any nerds in the audience remember that Tristan, maybe you because i consider you like a nerd in a computer science way so there is this um very famous function of square root which was um, introduced by by the team of quake 3 so it didn't it wasn't written by john Carmack, but the, you know the quake 3 is the first shooter 3d game and kind of was you know super um, novel in many ways and there was this function which computes a a fast square root of a number of a vector so whatever some function and somebody wrote it and What's funny about this function is it's it's hard to understand because it's using some weird magic numbers, binary shifts, and uh, you know people. So there's actually quite a few YouTube videos about this function, how it came to life, and uh, it's for for the nerds in the audience. I highly recommend this. The point is that this code of Quake Three was later uh, made public on GitHub and basically open sourced, but it's still copyrighted. So it means. You cannot use this square root function if you want to do you know, if you want to just take it over you can't because it's copyrighted so you cannot sell it in your products or whatever so if you ask github copilot to if you start typing your the name of the function which is quake r s q r t and the parameter is a number excuse me it's a square root, square root number of a, a square root of a of a number you start typing that and GitHub Copilot starts basically spitting out the original function. But after a few kind of uh, tokens, it uh, it knows or it's uh, there are some mechanisms in Co- Copilot saying, well, wait a second, it really resembles some original training data. So maybe you were breaching copyright and we should stop generating this content. So this is good. So people build kind of think about this spitting out training data and build some mechanisms in Copilot. So it's prevented. This is great. Well, what happens if you're a bad guy and start prompting the model with the same number, uh, name of the function, so Q S Q R T, but then you translate uh, the the variable number just into French, nombre. So you start typing this. What happens? Well, no surprise. I mean, <laughs> Copilot will spit out a complete original square root function from Quake three but all the variables will be in French. So basically it's breaching copyright because it's the same code, but just the variables are, you know, they're named differently. And and this is an issue, right? I mean, the models are kind of vulnerable to these sort of very uh, very creative prompts. So you they try to paraphrase, paraphrase, and they try to generate what you want them to generate. So even when prevented from generating exact engrams from the training set, models are capable of cheating the filter and producing closed paraphrases. So this is a very cool paper from, I guess, last year, December. So we see it's not only about privacy, but also like spitting out training data. So I guess these few examples made it clear that we need privacy preserving methods for NLP and, and generative models in particular. So I'm going to structure this talk into, I would call two phases. So one would be more, I would call it core research so about privacy preserving natural language processing. And I will highlight uh, a few examples from more like inter- interdisciplinary research and beyond. So let me start with the core, core research question. And the one we should address is, well, what is actually privacy? What do we mean by that? All right. So, oops. Excuse me, I just got lost completely because I clicked on something on Zoom and it was not a good idea. Okay, so I'm back here. Um, what? Uh, so let's some let's talk about some background on privacy. So the first thing you might think uh, think of when you want to want to implement privacy is just well, what if we just anonymize data? Like, uh, let's take a text and change. The name of a person like Robert Smith here into some ID. So the bad news here is that uh, maybe that's possible and it's either doable or not. But if you combine this data with another data sets and some some data sets you know other people might have access to, 
and perf you, you are performing so so-called linkage attack. So you're linking your data, which might be anonymized, to some other data like background information, which might actually help you to reveal your name. So um, there's a couple of examples, and I'll show one later. So just basically anonymizing or replacing entities or replacing a, num um, a name, it's not enough. So th this is bad. Um, unfortunately, this is so common that we should really talk about it. So for example, you know, this is our ad hoc treatment of privacy. So here's an example. In, uh, in 2016, the Austrian government uh, tried to open their data and they released uh, medical billing records of 10% of 10% of Australians, about like 3 million people. And each patient was uh, somehow anonymized. So the supplier's patient's ID were encrypted, which means replaced by a random ID. But it was obvious like which bill of the medications which belonged to which person. So they tried to anonymize the data in, a, in this simple way. So now you've seen you know, this uh, linkage attack, so you might be guessing what, what can go wrong here. And of course, unfortunately, there was this paper uh, a year later showing that um, um, a few mundane facts often suffice to isolate an individual. So they were able to uh, reveal, actually to extract the original names of the real patients by using the plain old linkage anime attack. So uh, using some third party information or some background information, you cannot you know, undo this privatization and it, was just, uh, it will break the privacy. So this was uh, really a, kind of a bad use case here. So maybe we should do something better. Uh, we should mm, take some more, let's say, let's say formal treatments of privacy and let's try. So now after show after I show you a couple of examples, you may be asking, uh, well, I might be asking you. So if I saw you in the audience, unfortunately, I don't see you. But uh, if you can raise your hand, how many of you think that privacy matters? I cannot see anything, but I'm expecting this, right? <laughs> so that's maybe why you're here in the audience in the first place. So privacy matters, of course. Now pre let's pretend you are, let's say you're my students in my class and I wanna ask you um, whether you cheat in your homework. So maybe, you know, maybe I'll, I'll, I'm, I'm gonna ban ChatGPT for doing homeworks, but you're gonna still use that. So if I'm gonna ask you like, uh, Maybe Tristan. So Tristan, have you cheated? If I'm going to ask you, have you cheated in my in my homework? Well, the answer you would say like, no, of course not, because you don't want to be the you know the bad guy. Uh, you want to pass the exam. So nobody will tell me whether they cheated or not. But what if I'm really interested in asking this question? Like, not who actually cheated, but on average, like how many how many people out of my hundred students, in my class, is it like fifty percent of them? Is it twenty percent? Is it everybody? So I want to find this out and maybe there's a way um, and this way includes uh, coin flipping. So we're not going to run this experiment here. It might be fun when you're really, you know, in a, in real life, in audience. Well, maybe if you happen to have a, have a coin, you can try. So the, the, the procedure goes like that. You take a coin, toss it. And if, uh, if, if it comes um, heads, you tell me the truth. Like, uh, yes, I cheated or no, I didn't cheat. Like each individual will tell this. If it comes heads, sorry, excuse me. If it comes tails, you toss again. And depending on the second toss, then you will give me the answer. So if it comes heads, you say, yes, I cheated. If it comes tails, you say, no, I didn't cheat. So basically there is some probability that your answer will be completely random. And there is some probability that your answer will be the truth one. And you can exactly specify these, you know, these probabilities. So what does it tell, what, how does it work then? Like basically if I'm gonna ask then Tristan, sorry, I'm, I'm, I'm misusing you. If I'm gonna ask Tristan, have you cheated in your exam? And you, you run through this, uh, through this process and answer yes. I can't tell whether you're a cheater or not because you have this so-called plausible deniability. You can always say, yeah, it wasn't me, it was the coin because I don't see the process. So there's some randomness in your answer. The point is, so your, privacy is pre 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 um, preserved or prevented. So I don't see the truth value. But if I do this, if I ask this question with this process over the whole classroom, like hundred people, I can actually get a pretty good estimate how many people 
on average, maybe cheated or not. So I'm getting my answer, which I really want to answer, um, uh, which I were, uh, which was, which I really ask, and um, still preserving everybody's privacy. So this is very, very famous thing, already since the 1960s, and it's uh, it's called a randomized response, but it's one particular instance of um, something we know as differential privacy nowadays. And this tiny little epsilon here is the strength of privacy. It's basically telling how um, the, the lower, the better. So if epsilon would be zero, it would be like complete privacy for everybody. And it grows exponentially, as we will see later. So this is local differential privacy um, by protecting everybody's privacy. Okay, so we have a, one mechanism of protecting privacy, but of course, you know, handling with bits. So basically, this is a bit information, handling with bits. There is a long way or a long a big gap between bits and uh, and working with text. So let's uh, let's try to move forward. So one typical scenario is that uh, you want to train nowadays models with the standard hammer, which is a stochastic gradient descent. So let's say you have a, a data set of three individuals, Dave, Sand, and Julia, and you train a model doing something, let's say, I don't know, predicting whether they have a condition, a medical condition. So if these were like medical records, you want to uh, make a predictor for some medical conditions based on this medical record. So you train the model with uh, SGD. And what you get, the model is basically a, a, the architecture of the model and the bunch of parameters. And you basically decide by training which parameters, you know, optimizing for the parameters. So this is a very standard thing. The point is, yeah, so what we are using for it is stochastic gradient descent. I'm showing here just a simple example of minimizing the loss. So basically we're doing step by step and trying to minimize the loss over the training data. And the, the only equation, I guess, in this, uh, in this talk is this uh, update. So... The theta are the parameters of the model, and in each step or the, the next step, t plus one, we're taking the current parameters, and then take this this eta uh, t, so which is the learning rate, and the gt, which is the gradient. So the gradient is basically the the optimization hammer. So we know how to optimize each of the parameters of the model. So okay, this is great. This is the the only thing where we actually accessing the information from the training data, right? Because we in each step we run. Uh, the the back propagation and we ask what's the gradient given this training data and my current parameters and then we do the step in the in the parameter space okay so this will be important because we're updating the the parameters iteratively and the parameters kind of can learn something from the training data or leak something from the training data so what we want to do is to to publish a model and we might want to use differential privacy in publishing um, the actual train model. So, for example, we have this data set with, again, Dave sent in Julia, and we train um, a model. Then what if we um, remove Dave from the data set? So we have uh, something which we call a neighboring data set. So the other data set is just one, one item smaller, and we train another model. So what we are getting, there are two models, M1 and M2. And they, are, they have the same architecture, but the weights will be a little bit different. And if you're a bad guy and you have access to this um, to the second model with Sandy and Julia, you might want to find out whether Dave was in the training data or not, for example. So that's what you want to prevent. So the the idea is here. We talk about this randomized response and coin flipping. Basically, it's a it's a it's a noise um, or random process somewhere. And the idea here is that we're gonna during this training of um, with stochastic gradient descent we're going to add some random noise to each of the gradients. So in each step of the gradient, we're going to say, well, the gradient will be a little different. So we sample some noise and it won't be precise, but it will still learn the model. And it gives us some guarantees. Uh, I don't want to go, I, I'm, I'm not going to go into details, but the, the important part of the guarantees is it says the amount of information which will be leaked from the trained model is bounded by this epsilon or e to epsilon so this is important to know this is the worst worst case scenario whatever happens no matter whether you are very powerful adversary very bad guy having all the quantum computers if you see the output of differential privacy differential private excuse me differential private uh, model training or algorithm you cannot undo it and the maximum leak of information is bounded by this uh, e to epsilon. So this is like really worst worst case scenario. And 
that's why it's formal treatment of privacy because it tells you well in the worst case you're going to lose if you participate in a data set that amount of information but it's a probabilistic treatment of that all right so this is the basically introduction to how to make it work and let's talk about a little bit of de generative uh, dp mo uh, generative models with differential privacy so just a refresher on what is uh, what is language model this standard treatment of uh, of language models and even like a gpt way of treatment of language models is that it predicts the probability of a word following a string of text so you're given a couple of words it could be a prompt and then it, given this this context uh, it predicts what is the most probable next word to continue the sequence so basically a, prob a probability distribution over the vocabulary Okay, so this is great. This is how we can generate the text and, and the, the actual model for estimating probabilities could be something from very simple Engram models to uh, transform models like GPT. So the problem of privacy for language models is actually related to the problem of privacy for text generation models because that's the nowadays um, kind of state of the art of, of, um, of text generation, excuse me, like language models are uh, generation models. And the question we are asking here is whether we can design a privacy preserving model that actually performs text generation, right? We talk about this training with uh, stochastic gradient descent with privacy, which has been used quite a lot on different classification tasks, but we are, uh, we, are, we are interested in like, can you do it for generation? Well, something like that would prevent maybe the case of, you know, leaking information from ChatGPT, maybe something along these lines. So we look into neural machine translation and the goal here is that, well, why is it important? Why, why machine translation and might be an important use case? Well, maybe you you want to utilize a, um, if you have a company, you want to utilize your internal data and maybe train a machine translation model and offer this translation on your private data. So company data and nobody should see the data and you want to offer an API. So through this API, you would be basically uh, prone to kind of hex something that we saw in the chat GPT. So you want to protect the privacy of your uh, machine translation, translation system. So that's we, what we looked into and uh, it comes with a lot of challenges. I'm, I'm, I'm not going to spend so much time on that. So this, the, the, the original idea of training stochastic with stochastic gradient descent with this differential privacy is kind of, I wouldn't say simple, but it's uh, conceptually not complicated. But when you want to scale it into a uh, large data set, so maybe fine tuning a uh, large model like MBART on large data sets such as WMT for machine translation, you're going to run in troubles because it's just so slow for many reasons in there. So we uh, we developed a, a new sort of framework for doing this on scale in, in a very scalable manner. So here's some frameworks or components we are, we are utilizing here, such as JAX, Flex, and other uh, high throughput libraries for doing uh, better parallel training on on uh, of deep learning models. The problem is with privacy on differential privacy in particular is this sort of trade-off. So if we, leave, you know, this is the standard WMT16 English German data set. So everybody who's doing anything with machine translation knows this uh, WMT data sets. There are sort of standards and um, the score we are evaluating here is the blue score. So this is uh, some sort of n-gram overlap. And of course, the higher, the better the translation is. And what we see on the x-axis, excuse me, what we see on the x-axis is a um, is a strength of privacy, this constant epsilon. So as we saw, the lower the epsilon, the better privacy, and the higher, uh, the worse. And on the right-hand side, we see infinity. So this is basically the machine translation without any privacy in place. So the epsilon would be infinity. And we get something around like 35 blue score. And we see the trade-off we're getting here. So with lower epsilons, the, the performance really drops. So if you remember the epsilon for this randomized response, right, and you're cheating in exams or not, we talk about something around one. If we want to apply epsilon of one for this generative model for machine translation, we're getting only 26% of the performance of the non-private. So this is really, I mean, is it bad or good? It really depends on uh, how, how you really utilize these models in, in, in praxis. But the trade-off is 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 real. So you know there is the privacy is not for free. 
so we're kind of still working on this to find what uh, you know how could how to improve that it's really um it's also like a matter of hyperparameters or maybe bigger models or using some uh, adaptive training and stuff like that. So this is a running research now. And also the training, actually, it's really, really, really expensive because of this noise addition during this training with differential privacy. So it takes uh, maybe four times more just to train this model. And uh, if we want to try everything on our tiny GPU cluster, it's uh, it's getting very long. So two months spent on just all these experiments. Well, anyway, but there's good news for the for the community. So we released that just last week for um, as a DPNMT, so differential scalable differential private machine translation system. And this is you know the, basically if you're interested in doing anything with these experiments with this with this framework, just uh, fork it on GitHub. And we have also like a very short YouTube video how to run it with Docker, so everybody can really utilize that. The goal here is basically to be really, really, really transparent about everything doing in this privacy setup because not not all papers, unfortunately, and we'll see some examples later, are doing that. So we're trying to be super transparent. Okay. Excuse me. So let's move on. This was um, machine translation. But it was just basically a model should be trained such as it's preserving privacy. So if you release the model, then it will it won't reveal anything from the training data. But how about privatizing texts? Right? We talk about this anonymization in text. So the point is that writing tells really a lot about you. So for example, there's this uh, famous competition running over a couple of uh, maybe a half a decade already or maybe longer. Um, I guess it's uh, from peop uh, by people from Weimar in Germany. And it's this author profiling, so this pen context, which means, well, given a text, you are you need to um, infer whether the person, so what's the gender of the person here? Yeah, I mean, they simplified it to binary, uh, binary gender. What's the age group? So a couple of categories of ages and maybe native language. So, and of course, you know, these are, the results are not just random. So the writing tells a lot about you as, and if you could train a, a machine learning model on your writing style, it will reveal something about you if you just tweet. So um yeah we need to protect so can we use this local differential privacy for this texture writing and the idea would be well, we have a couple of persons here and each of them writes uh writes a piece of text and then we would basically take each of them uh, separately and rewrite it so sort of like rephrasing but re maybe it's a rephrasing but with these differential privacy guarantees in there. So somewhere in there will be some some noise addition which will fulfill these formal formal guarantees which we want. And then of course we can use this rewritten text for let's say downstream task model training or so here's an example for intent detection would be like the original text would be uh, like that. So when is the first flight from Baltimore to Los Angeles on Sunday morning and the and the class label would be flight information, okay? And if we, so in theory, if we rewrite this text uh, using this rewriting with local differential privacy, we would end up with something, well, not the same. It would be rephrased. Maybe the entities will change. Like when is the last flight from New York to Chicago on Friday evening? So it's a completely different flight. I mean, you would basically, you know, I wouldn't recommend doing this. Like if you really need to fly from somewhere to somewhere, but for if you had any of these instances and you want to try and classify for flight information or in intent classification, excuse me, for intent classification, maybe that would be enough. So the noise will kind of like cancel out on the large scale. So this is the idea. And there there was there were actually papers um, talking about this, uh, this approach, like I, I would say like two years back. And one of them was from, uh, from people from Amazon Alexa about some sort of differential private text uh, transformation, basically this sort of approach. And the trick in differential privacy is it's, uh, it's both formal and experimental. And and unfortunately, these guys had a sort of like a bug or, or a glitch in the, in the formal proof. And if you dig deeper, you will find that uh, that actually their proof was wrong. And if you do it correctly, there is no privacy at all, or it's just infinity. So this is really hard. And what makes it harder that not everything is uh, made public. So for example, the, the source code for this paper was not made, was never made public, and you need to really dig deeper. And uh, you know, well, basically, if the 
if the numbers look too good to be true for privacy, then there is something uh, something maybe fishy about this paper and it needs really scrutiny. So we did this. And of course, we want to address this lack of transparency for facility. So, but this is a side note on, on transparency, right? So who, well, who of you read the G GDP, uh, excuse me, GPT-4 technical report? So maybe you read this like 100 pages archive paper and maybe it wasn't even archive, but anyway. 100 pages paper and there is a section on reproducibility and transparency and it's just this sentence long. So given both the competitive landscape and the safety implication of large scale models like GPT-4, this report contains no further details about the architecture, including model size, hardware, training, compute, data set construction, training method or similar. So zero, it means like, yeah, uh, that's absolutely trustworthy. You have no idea what's in there. So transparency. I guess for us researchers, are, you know, transparency is a key and especially if you're talking about privacy you need to how do you trust that what they're doing is is right i mean we've seen so many instances that even if there is a code well then maybe there's a bug in the code so actually the actual experiments are kind of wrong in normal research like normally in a way you're building your i don't know sentiment classifier if there is a bug and it works well that's fine okay well it's a bug but it's fine but here if you pro if you uh, with privacy if you really promise privacy and then don't deliver basically break the, the promise it's a bad sign well anyway so we we took it seriously published a couple of papers on that so one was a calling demo paper and one was um acl findings paper where we kind of re-implemented the original adept paper i showed in the previous slide and and develop a new sort of local differential privacy framework for um uh, for texture writing and it's just much better than other systems and um and we also kind of uh, revealed another, it revealed another another bug in this in the previous systems. What I'm what you see here actually is the important part is the epsilon. So the epsilons are uh, you know in a hundred. So this is very 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 high epsilon. And actually theoretically it's a almost zero privacy. It's really it's important to keep in mind that uh, for texture writing with this local differential privacy, the epsilons are still very very high maybe it's not usable at all so there's something to be decided we don't know how these epsilon should be big so far but i'll talk about it a little bit later okay so you can rewrite text and again i mean if you want to experiment or use it just out of the box just download it and there is a, this whole framework pre-trained models using bart and you can rewrite your texts if you want what we are what we're doing now also like exploring text generation so um so this is like current work so diffusion models are great for generating text and they use also some sort of noise in there. So this is great. We know we can syn synthesize uh, text. So this is another approach. When you build a model, you can let it synthesize like generic text, which shouldn't maybe reveal any private information if you combine it with differential privacy. So this is great. If you train a model with differential privacy, then let it generate fake data. No privacy should be breaking, so broken. So this is this is great. And we just want to combine these to like diffusion models for text. They are not really as good as uh, large language models like left to right um, autoregressive models, but we kind of believe that this inherent noise in there would make them more robust uh, with this privacy setup where you need a lot of noise in where. So this is um, this is a running research basically. And uh, I don't have any, any results yet to show here, but it's uh, it looks really promising so far. So I'm, I'm super happy to talk about it maybe, you know, in half a year. So this was this first part about these um, privacy preserving things, but then let's look at the actual the user perception of privacy. So we talk about these epsilons from one until hundred or infinity. And the question is really like, will you give me your data if, uh, yeah, maybe, I don't know. So we, we set up an experiment with two scenarios. One scenario would be uh, concerning medical records. And we said, well, okay, listen, um, I want your data. So your text data, so maybe medical records. And I'm a, I'm a good guy. I'm, I'm going to run a nonprofit organization and I just want to improve treatment options. I'm not a big, bad guy for collecting it for, let's say, advertisement or stuff like that. Okay, so this is one scenario. The other scenario was that um, I want to ask you for your messenger data. So like, uh, you know, WhatsApp, the last 50 WhatsApp messages. And again, you know, the goal is that I'm a, I'm a good guy and I just want to run, um, I want to create a, an, a learning app for, for learning language, like a le language learning app. 
which everybody can use like uh, you know for it's for the better good so to say so these were these two scenarios and my question would be like will you give me your data if i for example i guarantee you a differential privacy is epsilon of 10,000? Well, that's a question. Will you give me your data? So let's find out. We asked a couple of people, well, hundreds of people on um, in, a, in, this, um, in this behavioral study where, so the good thing about differential privacy is that uh, you can express it as probabilities. So probability of being, your data will be leaked somehow, can be expressed. And you can express probabilities for people as this um, natural frequency. So one out of 10 million, maybe your data will be leaked. Or one, of one out of 1,000, your data will be revealed. So you can let people guess the you know, turn probability uh, frequencies and then let people answer whether they will share or don't share the data under these circumstances. So we run it, run it on, a, on a prolific platform for, for a couple of couple of weeks, I guess, with uh, more than 250 participants. And everybody answered hundreds of these questions to make it really like a robust estimate. So what we found out, what we see in these results, of course, um, so this is dependent also on the data set size. So if I'm going to tell you you're going to be in a, in a data set of 10 million people, it will make a difference than if you're going to end up in the data set of 1,000 uh, 1, people because the, you have the feeling in, in the 10 million you're going to hide in the crowd. And this is exactly what we what what uh, what we see here. So, the the bigger the data set, the people will be um, giving their data into, the, um, the the bigger chance they will actually give us the, the permission to use the data. So this is great, but we see the differences here. So on the on the left hand side, we see that people are actually not willing to give us data for epsilons over two, maybe so uh, epsilons of four. No matter what happens, nobody will give us, uh, or on average, they will they won't give us any data. While on the right hand side, they are more tending to give us the data, even with higher epsilons. So they're more risking, risking that. So guess what? So what are people more more willing not? Well, what are people actually not willing to give? And to our surprise, <laughs> it was the messenger data. So people actually, for some reason, don't want to share. Wouldn't theoretically share. Their WhatsApp messages, they would rather share their medical records. I don't understand why that is. I'm, I don't know. We didn't ask in detail, but this is the trend. So, and also what I say, like um, people feel safer when hidden in, in the crowd. What is really kind of the takeaway message from this? So, this is a paper which is now it's I guess somewhere on under review and it's on on archive already. Um, the takeaway message here is that. Uh, Anything under epsilon of of two or maybe four is impossible. <laughs> and if you remember all these epsilons before of ten or hun even hundred, of course these are hypothetical scenarios. Like uh, in theory, for these epsilons, this works. But if you really need to get real data from real people under real circumstances using real epsilons, then you need to make it to much, 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 much lower. So there is a lot of room for improvement in this trade of privacy versus utility, right? So, and having said that, I guess this is already almost at the end of my uh, of my talk. So if it sounds exciting, um, let's discuss right now. Uh, I'll keep my slides here. Uh, and this is, you know, thanks to my collaborators, Timur, Lena, Ying, Manuel, Chris, uh, and other people from uh, Trust HLT. And if you have any questions, um, I think it's time to discuss right now. I'll keep my window open here like the slides. So uh, if you have any questions, I can just come back. Okay, Tristan, thank you.